Yes, hello and a very good evening to all who have joined us for this webinar. To begin with, I would like the viewers to know a little bit about Vidyadan Foundation. Vidyadan Foundation is a non-profit organization which works towards empowering underprivileged children, youth and women through education so as to enable them realize their potential to the fullest and bring about sustainable changes in their life. It also inspires the young generation to work for the development of students living in the rural areas. As I speak, the members and volunteers are at work towards the goal of quality education. We all know that India is hosting the G20 summit this year. The purpose of C20, that is Civil 20, is to function as a platform to bring forth civil society organizations' voices to the G20 leaders to discuss policy gaps and suggest best practices in education and skill development domain, a number of consultations and discussions are being initiated. In order to help C20 to enrich the policy suggestions, Vidya Dan Foundation has organized this webinar, Education and Digital Transformation. I'm Shweta Batra, an educational and counseling consultant, content creator and teacher trainer I've served as a principal and I'm a project uh, program coordinator at Vidyadan. I'll be taking you through this webinar along with the distinguished guest speakers. To begin with, we have Ms. Lina, Mrs. Neela Bokil. She is NASA Honeywell Space yeah. Educator, founder Astro Education Pune and a science communicator. Her entire education has been through National Merit Scholarship Madam has a postgraduate in telecom engineering and management. Madam Lena has been has done a course in astrobiology and research for alien life from Edinburgh University's astronomy department and is currently pursuing her pre-doc research in aliens and ET existence from the prestigious University of Edinburgh, UK. Ms. Lena, Mrs. Lena has visited NASA six times in various capacities and is a recipient of numerous awards to name a few Young Women in Engineering Award, coveted Savitri Bai Phule Award, Kranti V. Jyoti Sikshan Puraskar, and is also a recipient of the Rotary's Paul Harris Fellowship. Ms. Lena has also been felicitated by the Honorable Chief Minister of Goa, Dr. Pramod Savant, on Chhatrapati Shiva Jayanti on the 19th of February 2021. Madam has also been invited for numerous interviews on various platforms for panel discussions and expert talks on astronomy, space, and technology. So a warm welcome to you, Madam. Uh, we also okay. have with us Mrs. Nilima Penumurthy. Madam is the director of London-based Story R. Story R's aim is to connect cultures with which it does by producing timeless stories from India through one hour long audiobooks and short puppet stories shows. Uniquely, Ms. Lilima works with teenagers as authors and narrators. The audiobook on Ramayana and Indian independence received glowing reviews in leading newspapers like the Hindu and the UK Times and has wonderful reviews from leading authors such as Dr. Shashi Tharoor and Sri Amrish, Amish Tripathi. Their flagship Ramayan puppet show which conveys the Diwali stories in just about 20 minutes featured on the BBC London. And yes, their audio books are available online on their website. A warm welcome to you, madam. Uh, further, we are so glad to have Dr. Indira, BMD, and renowned educationist from Bangalore. Mrs. Indira is a former educational, I mean, agricultural scientist turned educationist. She is also a Bharatanatyam dancer, she forayed into education by teaching dance to children with learning disabilities and special needs. She has been working in education industry since the past 15 years as a teacher, trainer for teachers, and also a visiting faculty to teacher training colleges. Currently, she is working with Center as a senior associate. A hearty welcome to you, madam. Um, now it's time that we straight dive into the conversation that we are here for. I would like to begin by putting the first question to Mrs. Lina. And uh, the question that I would like to put forward to you would be that India is being called the global guru. And the world is definitely looking up on and up to for solutions to India. Would like you to request you to share on the importance of multilingual 
self-paced approach in education, keeping in mind the global cultural diversity that we are in, and also suggest how it can be implemented through educational and technology. Hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here to address uh, this uh, you know, seminar and especially this question, this topic itself is very close to my heart. Uh, today, I'm a space educator and I'm a global uh, person, but I act local. And um, yes, uh, this question is very valid today in the present scenario. Why? Because uh, India is looked upon and looked up as a great superpower, not only in technology, but first and foremost in education. Today, our young India or youngistan, the young uh, blood, the youngsters, they are doing great, not only in India, but abroad, elsewhere, globally. And our education system has a great uh, you know, relevance with this. So our formal education, especially the schooling and then the junior college, and uh, then uh, like, as in my case, I'm an engineer. So the technical education, I speak from my own, uh, this, you know, rich experience. And because I'm an educator and youngsters come to me for mentoring, uh, especially they're all mostly engineers and some are science graduates, et cetera. So uh, what is it that makes India so special, so great when it comes to education? Our formal education, and especially when it comes to the basics, uh, uh, you know, fundamentals, the core branches, and in engineering or in science, it is physics, chemistry, mathematics. So, uh, when I look at look at this, you know, in the in depth, uh, the insight that we get from this is that our education system makes youngsters, the kids, the students, uh, perfect. If not perfect, but uh, you know, they make our fundamentals very strong. So, therefore, our engineers, uh, when they become BE or BTech, they become engineers they are going for higher studies elsewhere globally, or they do their studies in India as well, the higher studies. So this uh, continuing education and the higher studies, uh, our students do well, extremely well, they do there, out there, because our fundamentals and the whole uh, system is so strong. They have already done a lot of work, you know, the grueling uh, lot of term work submission and the teaching learning process is very, strong so therefore our youngsters do well extremely well globally and i would like to share a few of the slides that uh, i have made you know just a moment it takes a few seconds yeah okay can you see the screen i'm sharing yes it is visible yes ma'am yes okay so uh, education for life and when our kids, the youngsters are becoming tomorrow's citizens and they are already becoming global citizens. The world is uh, geographically, you know, shrinking in the sense the borders shrink. We are becoming global gurus and the world is looking up to us, especially when it comes to sustainable solutions. Why? The silent feature is because I believe that India has an unparalleled potential and this new age uh, innovative teaching learning process is also empowering us and we are becoming we are fast becoming a global superpower when it comes to education uh, thanks to our very conducive and favorable ecosystem so especially uh, uh, you know 2020 onwards the pandemic impact also it has shaped and reshaped our education system and therefore, the teaching learning process has become very global now, because as we now talk and uh, you know give this uh, conduct this seminar as well, people sitting anywhere in the world, anytime, anywhere, you can have access to uh, such content. So, the education system that we are, uh, you know, the existing one that we have, and we are imparting that quality education. I guess that has got a lot to do with uh, our uh, standard of teaching learning and also the rise of uh, digital electronic and uh, hybrid systems like the webinar seminars as in this case 
I give a lot of talks now uh, in this form. Uh, so thanks to uh, Google and Zoom and all this. So we have been partnering with many of the global system, uh, the uh, you know people who are into this field, imparting education and content sharing, all this stuff globally. So the partnership collaboration is enabling us to do great amount of networking. So the uh, you know knowledge and experience that we have, we can share easily with people globally. So my talks used to be restricted only to schools, colleges, and today uh, through such talks, uh, through webinars, through, through digital medium, uh, I can reach out to, to my global students, to youngsters. So thanks to this teaching learning process and especially the lockdown taught us a lot. So despite the lockdown, actually, Many students come to me for letter of recommendation when it comes to going elsewhere abroad for higher studies to the US, Canada, Europe. My students are there in Australia, New Zealand. Globally, they are placed everywhere except Antarctica. Yeah, so uh, this uh, the travel restrictions that were there during lockdown, then now they are all relaxed. And especially after 2021 it saw a sea change and many students have been going abroad and yes they are going for higher studies why do they go outside because maybe they feel that relevant knowledge uh, they get there out there is far more superior than your what we get and mm -hmm. the experience they'll uh, get from there they'll come back to india some of them and they'll work for the nation for the nation building that is how my students uh, have been doing so uh, in, when it comes to higher education, following your dreams and aspirations, those dream jobs and the career, that is what students are now doing. And this was a bit of a restriction uh, way back before pandemic, especially. So today, like I said, especially after 2021, we have seen we have been seeing in, in, an increase in uh, the students going abroad for higher studies. And in India itself for MS, MTech and higher studies, they are doing that from here as well. So it doesn't matter now where you are placed, right? So this is how uh, it looks like. And uh, several countries are also uh, collaborating with the Indian government and universities and student exchange and international students. They are coming from uh, abroad. They are coming here and our students are going elsewhere. So we are becoming very global at that. So that is something that uh, I wanted to, uh, you know, address. And then the education sector uh, has undergone massive digital transformation. So the people who are doing jobs, their IT uh, jobs and careers, they already use this kind of technology. But when it comes to education, uh, 2020 onwards, the lockdown, the pandemic taught us a lot. So digital transformation uh, happened. Uh, it's a, uh, you know, phenomenal change that we see now. And there's a significant shift in the consumer or the students or the, uh, you know, youngsters, the behavior. So uh, all this is making India a great power, empowering us because we already have the content and we are delivering that to the, uh, you know, people elsewhere. And our students are going abroad, plus the international students are coming here. So there is a lot of exchange and networking that is possible, which we back then, uh, you know, when I started my career and I just went into electronics telecommunication field, and then I attended only state level, district level, state level uh, conference and national conference. And my first international conference was when I attended in Orlando, Florida, the International Space Conference. So this exposure I got in my 30s. Today, the students are getting in the teens and in the 20s. So you can see uh, this, uh, we can all experience how uh, we have undergone uh, this process. Uh, we are going, progressing towards better and better uh, quality. So like I said, uh, imparting education through digital medium, webinars and uh, uh, online talks, lectures, this is becoming very powerful. And uh, many students, uh, are getting glued to this and not only webinars but it's hybrid so it makes it far more flexible and uh, my uh, talks in physical presence they are far more effective even today I know but when it comes to technology I said the reach out 
I can go, I can reach the global, uh, you know, all nooks and corners. So this is becoming increasingly popular today because of technology, ICT, so on and so forth. And then like the innovative modes, uh, education system is also incorporating many, many, uh, you know, techniques. And we are bringing in uh, many technologies like digital education, innovative technology, and therefore even the practical skills are increasing immensely. So students are becoming far more empowered and this is enabling them to become uh, much more global. So they are becoming confident and empowering. Uh, we are giving them the skills. So that is also equally important, you know. Uh, yeah, so uh, this is all that I wanted to sum up. And um, I guess one part of the question was being multilingual, uh, does it help uh, students and teaching learning? Yes. It definitely does. I always say that we Indians are good at languages. And like as uh, my own case, I talk Marathi, uh, it's my mother tongue, and I uh, lived in Karnataka, Bore, Belgaum, Belgaum. So I studied there and uh, therefore I know Kannada and therefore a bit of some of the South Indian languages. And of course, Hindi is a national Rashtriya Bhasha and uh, we communicate and teach and learn in English medium. So this makes us, like people like me, already multilingual. And therefore, uh, when I communicate with my counterparts in Spain, Italy, I know a little bit of these languages. So it has given me the flair to learn so many languages, uh, language skills in the brain. I guess we Indians uh, already, and our forefathers uh, knew Sanskrit. My dad knows, but I never learned. So we are already good at many languages. And this is the reason I always uh, say we are good, we Indians are good in programming languages because that is a language itself, the IT software language, but it is just like the way we communicate with the machine or the, with the computer. So uh, this makes us very multilingual. And for me itself, like for me, uh, this has helped me a lot. I can connect easily with people uh, when I listen to some languages and this, not only has helped me when it comes to my uh, global image, but also the uh, teaching learning, uh, you know, we can grasp the topics easily because our language skills are far more developed than the others. Uh, so that is uh, why I feel uh, being multilingual and today's scenario, yes, that is very much needed. And um, for me as well, part of the success that I have, uh, you know, experienced I owe it to my, not just my hard work, but my communication skills, my language skills, and uh, the way I network with people. And, uh, you know, I reach out to the global uh, community. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, indeed. Thank you so much, Lena, Madam. I think you have put in uh, the very relevant points that you brought forward, I think, were like, you know, that as our uh, education system has been, it always lays the strong emphasis on strong fundamentals. So basically, if your fundamentals are clear, learning becomes much easier. The foundation is much e stronger. And also, yes, the, the term which you brought about is the interesting consumer behavior. Where we see there's a learner outspread everywhere. It's only about the structured content that one needs to be you know furnished with so yes that's again a very relevant and poignant point that you put forward and yes so what as educators we need to do is make sure that there is a structured content available easily and uh, also uh, since you said that being multilingual ensures seamless learning so how today we are able to conduct this meeting with uh, you know seamlessly because the wi-fi is so smooth therefore i think you know there is seamless learning if yes there is the language preference is given to learner is everywhere. Sometimes he or she is stopped because probably he is unable to grasp the language. Yes. Is there anyone else who would like to put a point across a point or two for us 30 seconds or so? Or we can move on to the next question. Uh, so there was this one little uh, line that you said, Lena, ma'am, which I really, really like. Be global and act local. <laughs> This is a modern version of the saying, when you're in Rome, be a Roman. True. This is a 
slightly more modified or a mutated form i can say a next gen form <laughs> thank you so much ma'am thank you so with this i think uh, we'll move on with uh, to uh, mrs indira uh, where the question that i would like to put forward to you is that one still cannot actually predict the exact skills that are required today for tomorrow's generation we really cannot predict whole heart all together but mm -hmm. yes at the same time it is imperative that we prepare the generation to be future ready that is something which is in our hands and we ought to do it as our duty uh, essentially we are sure that there are developing the core skills is definitely going to take them places and uh, i request you to suggest some real time solutions in developing these skills to prepare them to face the challenges that life is bound to offer irrespective of where one comes from that acceptance that yes challenges are bound to happen and yes we are bound to face them so i would like you to throw some light on this mrs sindra yeah uh first of all thank you very much vidyadan it's a great honor for me to be back here on vidyadan on the vidyadan platform um as ma'am said uh, shweta ma'am said that it is not possible for us to predict what are the skills that are required for the generation of tomorrow right but there are some as uh, leena ma'am to fundamentals of science of fundamentals of various uh, academic curriculum same way we have some core skills which are needed which will always be needed throughout our life whether today tomorrow or even in history okay some of those core skills i i have enumerated them as six of them there could be more but uh, taking into consideration the paucity of time the core the six core skills are digital literacy citizenship student leadership creativity and imagination communication and collaboration and last but not the least the sixth one is critical thinking and problem solving now all these six i have put them in the reverse order of importance okay reverse order of importance so basically critical thinking and problem solving is one of the most important ones but why i have put it in reverse order is something different a little bit silly but yeah i'll come to that <laughs> so coming to the first one that i said which is digital literacy digital literacy now basically it is being aware of the technology being able to use technology invest in technology in a very in a very very wise manner okay so thanks to the coronial times this digital literacy was like a rocket booster it just went off <laughs> <laughs> suddenly everybody all around is digitally aware everybody is on stuck on the mobile the best example i can give is uh, i remember as a 50 year old or um, yeah somewhere in her late 40s and all uh, my mother used to say don't give me mobile phone don't even bring it near me i'd hate it i don't like it and this and that and nowadays i see every day in the morning from uh, around 7:30 to 8 or 8:30 am she is on the mobile updating herself on all the news through youtube channels that is how digitally literate we all have become <laughs> digital literacy is very much required because we have to stay ourselves abreast of the technology latest technological advancements not because we have to be technologically literate but because it is one source to empower ourselves to make our lives others lives everything slight bit easier yes there are a lot of other associated problems with it which is quite true but if we know the wise use of technology that should never be a problem so that covers digital literacy and nowadays in schools or in uh, many organizations everywhere actions have been taken to ensure digital literacy among everyone then comes student literacy citizenship now i'll be covering both of these together because both of them come down to one main value which is responsibility okay 
this for this particular uh, skill. Now, I would not say it is very necessary to develop responsibility in children, give them gyan about responsibility or anything. No, that is that is a slightly outdated uh, way, if I may say so. But one of the best ways to instill or inculcate responsibility is to empower the children and make them feel responsible. Give them, make them in charge of a lot of different things. At school level, of course, we, we all of us as teachers, we make them in charge of different, different tasks. We, some of them are the school monitor, I mean, the class monitor. Some are the homework monitor. Some are the board monitors. Like this, we do automatically make them in charge. But how do we ensure that the tasks are being completed by the children? As an in-charge, it looks very nice, that little badge, you know, monitor in charge or uh, board monitor and things like that. But how do we ensure that the tasks are being completed? So this is something wherein the teachers and students have to come together, work together. I'm, I'm emphasizing on the fact students as well. Because even the fellow students play a very important role in ensuring that the monitor completes the job. Okay, here the difference should be made that they are not an authority, they are a responsibility. A monitor is not an authority, a monitor is just given a responsibility of some things. And that is one way of, uh, and personally, I have found it effective in my. Uh, life as a teacher and I have found it very effective for other schools as well where, wherever these programs were implemented. Then comes creativity imagination more than that it is communication and collaboration which is a very very important skill but unfortunately it is being ignored. Uh, I know I have another two minutes, but I'll try and wrap it up within one minute. Yes, communication and collaboration is something that is highly ignored in our uh, today's times. And unfortunately, somewhere down the line, it's not just teachers or the home environment. It is the overall society setup that has played to some extent a very important role in downgrading communication, I would say. A very simple example I can give you is people nowadays communicate, they talk very less. I'm sure all of you have noticed. They talk very less. But the moment you give them a mobile in the hand, the moment you exchange your mobile numbers, immediately on WhatsApp, they are very communicative. The problem is eye contact. The problem is there is a slight bit of stage fear. Now, by stage fear, you might think, how come uh, stage fear? Because there's no big stage that we are talking on. No, that is not stage fear. The problem is face to face looking at the person and maintaining eye contact and talking to them. This is lacking. <laughs> And I would really, really highlight on this point because this is a very, very disturbing trend among everyone. Whether they are youngsters or whether they are senior citizens, is a very disturbing trend that has come in. This communication and collaboration. The moment we develop that skill, half of the battle is achieved. Because it is through communication, a polite, respectful communication, a pleasant conversation. I'm not saying ha ha hee hee hoo hoo, cracking jokes and those kind of communication, but a very polite and a respectful communication wherein the other person does not feel intimidated. We don't feel intimidated. That kind of communication skill has to be brought in. For that, it is very necessary to have a student-centric pedagogy in schools not a teacher-centric one. Many schools follow this. They follow a teacher-centric pedagogy wherein the teacher is standing on the stage giving a lecture and walking off. 
but we need to follow student centric pedagogy that is one way of solving this big problem of communication gap or developing the communication skill and last but not the least that is the most important skill which is critical thinking and problem solving critical thinking and problem solving again as uh, here i would like to quote what lena mam said be global but act local you you think to solve the problems you think from a very global point of view but you should look for problems within your localized area a very small example i can give you is there i know i just one minute i will wrap it up okay uh, there is a geography teacher from uh, from a school in um, uh, one minute just a minute i'll yeah, uh, from a school in nagaland okay i'm not able to recollect the name of the exact place now this geography teacher what she did is she went on now she was a very she has traveled a lot to a lot of places and she lived a, at a lot of different places and then she came to nagaland back to her hometown and she was trying to she was a teacher so she was she joined a school over there and she was trying to uh, instill empower children through education so what she did she introduced the world map she introduced map of india uh, then there are we we learned about a lot of different places natural vegetation at a lot of different places and all that all these became very abstract for the children in the chapter throughout the chapter all these things were very abstract when the teacher realized this when and she she said okay my children are not able to relate because these are all abstract terms natural vegetation greenery mangrove and this and that so let me go local what what she did is she divided her class into different groups asked the children to actually identify the landform of the area that they are living in the house that they are living in the the landform of that particular area and it was very interesting to see she got three different types of landforms there then and there itself she got mountain ranges she got forest she got all these things so this is one place where she was actually thinking global but she acted local so when we focus when we as teachers when we focus on the local problems and ask the children help the children study the problems solve them arrive at a solution i would not say technically solve them but arrive at a solution that itself is a big learning for the children that gives them a huge experience on critical thinking and problem solving skills so with this i would like to end my talk i'm sorry if i short short overshot the time questions or any feedback please welcome no no there's absolutely no issue it's always a pleasure to listen to what you're saying and uh, yes i am so uh, like you know again in this i am feeling very worthy of the 10 minutes that we heard you is because you know what you use some some few words which i would like to catch hold of them as keywords because that's the way i generally go about teaching so what you called about responsible usage and what you're saying making in charge and more than anything else what i really appreciate is the word is where you coined the term authority versus responsibility mm -hmm. so that is mostly you know they come in power and they start taking disadvantage of it which in fact should be brought into notice and actually cultured in their manner that it is a position of responsibility and not authority this is tweaked into the mind state of students i think a great change will uh, definitely happen and uh, yeah as you said that eye contact and things like where they communicate i think one thing which i felt we can definitely apply is that you know uh, if we share shows we care and if we care we are definitely going to share so if these two terms are cleared into the students and they are i mean you know this is having empathy having the human quality which allows the other core skills to actually develop 
so yeah being a great human being is first what is important so these are the core things which your speech has you know actually reminded me to come to and uh, that uh, when you say that student centered pedagogy yes i would call that it is we are in work in progress when it comes to that because there has been an attitudinal change and uh, relatability is coming into being but yes it has to spread every nook and corner of our country to bring the sea change that we are looking for towards education and thank you so much for all that you have given your inputs uh, with this i would go to the next question and i would first put this question to nilima madam and the question is that apart from regional and cultural diversities that we are all aware we also have a varied population with physical and mental capabilities and opportunities so suggest an outreach solution that can help that can impact and help the students to lead a normal life in our society so I have... thank you yeah. yes. thank you very much shweta uh, ma'am and uh, uh, it was nice to hear leena ji and uh, um, indra ji talk so uh, to your question i mean as i said i'm not a, uh, um, i'm not a teacher by profession but what i have become as a content creator and i become a storyteller uh, as i was bringing up my children and to to create a level playing field for children of different abilities whether it is physical abilities or mental abilities i think i've had a little bit of a of a of experience in this uh, uh, area because through my content creation i have as an audiobook publisher i have realized that um, voice is a gift that everybody well most people have and i have reached out to the blind um, or the visually impaired to uh, add their voice for the audio books as narrators and that has been a wonderful experience because um i started with my own children who are uh, who are who are who are able as of now in every aspect and uh, touch wood and i'm thankful for that so then i thought okay if i were to take this story to a visually blind person how are they able to narrate because that's one thing that they are very capable of and we could provide a vocation where they could all become podcasters especially in this digital world they could become podcasters they could become voice over artists isn't it so i mean content has become so big content is king now so i mean with all the with the advent of all the ott platforms and this this too much of content so i was so most of these uh, contents have been dubbed either in different languages or even within the film the voice has been added as another layer on top of the visuals so i through my work have uh, reached out to the visually impaired who have um, who have narrated two of our audio books and they loved it i mean they are so good i mean because <clears throat> the sense of drama in their voice is as good as anybody else's so so that's one area where i think we could reach out to the visually impaired by tapping into their voice which of course you could give them several other skills like um, possibly sewing or uh, like the institute where i went to for our latest audio book on the indian independence which is the blind relief association in delhi they they get their students to make candles and probably some uh, cards etc cetera, etc cetera. but obviously what we can provide more opportunity for the visually impaired is by making more and more audio books making more and more content in audio format now even in that audio format we could use them as the narrators we needn't actually say that okay so we provide them the text and they, it gets converted into braille and they can therefore become narrators for the audio books that they use in their libraries so that's as far as the visually impaired are concerned and even with the uh, hearing impaired so for our puppet show film i worked with an uh, with an organization in london that they interpret the the language into a uh, sign language now in britain it is called the british sign language i'm sure there is something called indian sign language as well so what so what you can do is you could pick up several wonderful videos and actually empower the uh, the hearing impaired to uh, to to provide their interpretation so you are giving them you're not you're giving them a vocation for life you're probably paving a path for a career for them 
as opposed to and um, just just doing something for a short term basis. So and that's as I said because content is king now. I think these are the two aspects. Whether it is adding the adding um, the sign language to each and every video and let them understand how to add the sign language. And similarly, adding audio to as many books as possible and let that audio actually be the narration be done by the visually impaired because in that process, they read out. So, so if, if you were to give them an audio book, what they're doing is they're just listening to it. But if you give them the chance to actually create the audio version for that particular text, they are having to understand it at a, at a deeper level because when they're communicating it, they make sure that they communicate it more effectively. So therefore they're understanding that topic more intensely and I feel um, so uh, so those are the two areas I mean in which I've had experience therefore I can kind of I wouldn't say with complete authority but a fair bit of understanding I can say that this is something that is very very doable now for the mentally challenged I think that is an area I haven't yet ventured into to understand how to reach out to them how to engage them and actually create this common ground where they're probably able to interact with their family despite the challenges they have at the, at the same level playing field you're like for example with the by adding the the uh, sign language to our puppet show films what I have, my vision is that they all sit together as a family. So there's that little box that comes with the sign language. And therefore, after the show, after they've seen the film, they can interact with their, with their family about the same story, as opposed to them sitting separately and watching it separately. It can become a communal experience. So I think those are the kind of things I think we should figure out. Again, I get, I, I, I can, I'm aware that mental challenges are of different degrees. So what is applicable to one group of um, mentally challenged people may not be the same for, because it varies. Their cognitive ability, their intellectual ability varies for the mentally challenged. So I guess um, that is something that has to be done more specifically. You cannot have a banner audiobook or a sign language thing. This is a little bit more straightforward compared to working and making it more, uh, making it available for the mentally challenged. But um, I think technology in that respect has been an absolute bliss. In uh, And I have, again, I'm saying it from experience because during COVID, I worked with teenagers across the world um, because I wanted to add um, uh, lang different languages to our puppet show film and therefore I'd reached and oh I'd sent the script for the uh, for the puppet show film and the teachers from those particular schools like whether it's French, Italian, Gujarati, Hindi they're all translated it and these children used to send me their voice their narration first on WhatsApp then we would have Zoom calls where we would actually uh, tell them that they should possibly speak like this or have a pause here or maybe need, maybe emphasize this word so i think these are all transferable skills so what happens is yes with ai coming in there are there are the generative ai coming in certain things may become obsolete but there are certain transferable skills that everybody learns which is the discipline and the, the, the ability to reach, achieve a goal. So these, if, if we can inculcate transferable skills in the next generation, which obviously will, will we, these are all classic virtues, which is discipline, hard work, and, and the ability to sort of communicate effectively, focusing on the word. So these are the things if we can make it a must in the psyche of every child at school, so if we can if we can make them have certain transferable skills, then they will have the confidence to take it from one sector to the other. I mean, as um, uh, Indraji was saying, yes, having that eye contact, having that ability to, and as uh, Lina Ji was saying, which is so which is so right, I think Indians innately have the ability to pick up languages because we invariably listen to different languages. 
every region of India listens to at least two, three languages in one go simultaneously. So I think we are blessed like that. So there's somewhere we are able to form that connection more easily. So I think if we can enhance uh, the child's ability to speak in different languages by engaging with them in, in spoken language and listening, in improving their listening skills and therefore getting them to experience what it means to be speaking more confidently because I think if you are if you are blessed to be able to listen to good language, the chances are you will speak effectively as well. So I think as educators, it is important to provide tools whereby we can empower, which are free, whereby we can empower the next generation or children or anybody who's disadvantaged for, for various reasons to have that ability to understand language in a in a calmer in a in a more peaceful environment so that they're they're not ashamed of not having understood something so for example i had recently conducted a workshop with um, one of my audiobooks which is on the ramayan so i got them i printed out the chapters i got them to listen to the audiobook chapter by chapter so as they were listening to the chapter i would get them to underline um, uh, a word that they haven't understood or a phrase they haven't understood, which they did diligently. And then we would discuss. And then I would ask them to read that particular text aloud, like the way they've heard in the audiobook. And they all rose to the rose up to the challenge. So I think it's about making all these, these tools or these uh, uh, resources available across the board so that even the underprivileged have the ability and access to language at the same level as those who are privileged, who are who are you know who are listening to good language. So, uh, so that's my. So this is what I have understood from my experience that basically you can empower the visually impaired and the the hearing impaired quite effectively through these programs that I had uh, ex I had uh, done. And um, yes, I think being able to communicate effectively, we need to share the resources across across the country. Thank God we have 5G, et cetera, et cetera, everywhere. And to me, I mean, because I studied chemistry, when I'm emphasizing on transferable skills, in fact, I went to London to study chemistry and I did software development. Then I transitioned as I was bringing up my children into storytelling. So what I realized is what, what was it what was it that I learned in when I was doing my master's in chemistry? It's the re when I was researching, I was reading up a lot. I was making sure I was making data points. I was making sure I was following it up properly. So it's the same. It's the same skill that went into software development and now into into storytelling as well. So you write you write something. You go you go over it again. You make sure that it is being communicated properly. So I and 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 when I was in London uh, or in England or in the West, they basically emphasize a lot on transferable skills. Therefore, anybody, like people could be studying history or people could be studying classics, but they go into a completely different sector for their jobs because they know they have been, um, uh, they've been empowered with their, with this set of transferable skills that they can take into the next job and learn things quickly. So once you have the primary set of tools at a, at a, at a sort of substantial level, the chances are you will pick up other things, unless of course it's astronomy or uh, something too tedious. Most skills can be picked up because our brains are like sponges. So, uh, so that's my understanding from my experience so far in life, and I hope it, it it's useful. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you so much, uh, yeah, Mrs. Lilima, for these inputs, which have been. Uh, so much that I was so busy listening to you, I could not put down the notes. I was so engaged doing that. And I would give another 60 seconds to uh, Indira, madam, to, you know, give her inputs on this very topic as to how we could go about with, you know, giving these opportunities and reaching out to the, to every section of the society, please. Thank you, ma'am. I was all, I actually forgot even I should be talking on the same subject. <laughs> I was listening to Neelima Ma'am. Ma <laughs> okay. Um, to begin with, first of all, uh, I am as an educationist by teaching dance to children with specific needs. Uh, specific needs include autism, Down syndrome, and to some extent, um, uh, new regeneration. There, it became a very therapeutic method of teaching. 
gradually now i cannot teach them hardcore bharatanatyam dancing to uh, to any of these children so what i did was i just took some of the school curricular topics the easy topics and i choreographed i made some basic steps on that i taught the children surprisingly about 20 to 30% of the children i know that's a very small percentage but 20 to 30% of the children could actually dance the entire concept by dance i actually mean dancing it was water cycle that i taught them with actions they were able to say what happens after what and what happens at each and every step rest of the children that is about 30% of the children could relate water cycle through dance the rest of the children half of them what they did was some of them they were actually making drawings in the paper using all different colors that given probably if we use a amalgamation of different forms of art we can actually teach the children the concepts so that was an experiment that i did and bingo there was an art integration uh my internet seems unstable but am i audible yeah. okay so art integration came into the picture so there the focus became empowering the children differently abled children or differently able people of the society through these small little skills okay and then gradually i discovered that if we give them a gradual not a big challenge but a gradual push through various challenges they can accept it they are able to accept it they are able to do it and most of the children who are autistic and with down syndrome they enjoy instruments musical instruments another eye opener for me gradually they were taught to play the tabla play the violin or the guitar and there are half of them who are good musicians today and uh, so what i am coming down the moral of the story over here is we can empower these differently able people to all different forms of art now as neelima ji said storytelling for the visually impaired they were narrating story the visually impaired they were uh, narrating story and they were doing podcasts that is again a form of art here in bangalore and uh, there are a few restaurants that are run that are actually managed by people with disabilities i would not say disability i would say specific needs there is a restaurant and uh, one one chain of the restaurant is in bangalore airport if ever you come to bangalore airport do please take it a point unfortunately i'm forgetting the name of the restaurant but yes there are restaurants on that because cooking is an art now coming to visually impaired yes we have uh, this uh, restaurant it's a chain of restaurants but uh, called as dialogues in the dark yes it is there situated in hyderabad yes and i think there is one branch in pune or is it in mumbai i'm not quite sure but it is run by visually impaired and there even we go in with no light nothing we are entering the entire restaurant is a dark room we are entering there we are eating our food only with the help of our tastes and the sense of touch okay so cooking is another art with which all these people are empowered and they are going through so one best way from my observation and from my experience so far empowering 
the uh, people with specific needs and integrating them into the regular society, art plays a very, very important role. And art has been playing a very important role since, since eons. Uh, there is somebody, um, uh, the founder of Foot and Mouth Organization, uh, he passed away about 10 years back. But so he he lost his both his arms and his legs. So he started painting with holding the brush in his mouth. And that was again in Pune, in yeah. Khadki Cantonment. That's how he actually sta he started it from I think his name is Anil Nair, if I'm not wrong. So he held the brush in his mouth and he was painting. And all the, many of the corporate, during those times, we never had emails. Emails were still babies. <laughs> we used to give, exchange uh, New Year greeting cards, hard copy greeting cards to each other. Many of the corporates used to buy cards in mouth organization because they used to paint it with their mouth. They would, uh, you know, uh, that is how they actually... Uh, made a living and they got empowered in that so since since a very long time since history art has been one way of empowering people with specific needs and my personal opinion my ob from based on my observations and uh, experience so far moving forward if we broaden this platform called as art because nowadays, you know, digital art is also an art. Editing photographs or making digital paintings, that's all art. If we empower people with specific needs on these various platforms, it's going to be a huge impetus for all of them. Thank you so much. I have a question. Yeah, please. Oh, yeah. Um, Nilima, ma'am. Uh... I would like to connect with you later on uh, at a certain point. Uh, actually, this is because can we collaborate? I wanted to ask on this platform, but we'll talk about this later on. Uh, some of the students who come to me, they are astronomy and cosm cosmology geeks. And, uh, um, you know, I have also addressed students, uh, teaching them. And also, see, when I show a PPT, a presentation or a play movies, and it's all astronomy and all universe, so the blind uh, visually impaired cannot see that. So what we do is we uh, try to conduct uh, programs for them so that they listen to the sound of the universe yes. and things like that. Yes. And then there is the other way also, like the hearing impaired, they can see, but they cannot uh, hear the, uh, the sign language. Yes, yeah. the sign language. So it's a great, powerful medium, storytelling. And uh, I think we can develop content like this and reach out to so many uh, youngsters, uh, and especially those who are not normal. The students come to me, uh, they are elite and they are brilliant, high IQ. But then I always say, uh, I mean, I'm not saying no, not normal or abnormal, but I'm saying people with youngsters with special needs and the uh, you know special kids, they need to be addressed, and that is very important to reach out to all the people. And also, I appreciate this point that uh, Dr. Indira Ma'am uh, put across right now, just now, that uh, uh, performing arts, arts in all its forms, in all its forms, we are using them today not just to entertain people, but to educate. So that's a great thing. Like even I have attended a program where uh, you know uh, the special. Uh, people with different skills, they are maybe far more uh, greater skills than the normal people in music and all. And uh, we are no longer using this platform to uh, get entertained, but we are also educating and empowering. So that's very important. And I really appreciate it. And this foot and uh, mouth, uh, you know, the kids, we have been supporting them. And since I'm in Pune, and I'm uh, really, you know, honored they keep sending these cards to me as well. And I circulate and I share these as gifts to so many people during Diwali and season's greetings. But mm -hmm. yes, uh, they are immensely talented, far more than the normal kids. And yeah. they really need the platform and we need to create opportunities for them to come ahead, you know, and showcase yeah. their talents and skills. 
Uh, can I say something? Thank you so much, Lena, ma'am, for yeah. uh, reaching out to me. I, yeah. I, I mean, I, I don't know if it's the last uh, sentence. I do not know what the time is. But I think, to me, I feel we need to make things as communal, the experiences as communal as possible. Because even till date, the movies do not, mainstream Bollywood movies, do not have sign language on the side, right? So if you think about it, the hearing impaired mm -hmm. are are as it is exempted, they can't join in with their, let's say a family has a, hear, a child who's hearing impaired or somebody who happened, who over a period of time has become hearing impaired. Yeah. They can't join in. So if you, if you, by default, if you're not providing for them to participate in the same experience as the rest of the able sort of uh, people, then you're, forever treating them specially but whereas if they were to join what they will see is people laughing together people reacting together so that communal experience I think is quite empowering so if you if you have I mean obviously you cannot possibly take I mean maybe you could I do not know yet if you could take a visually blind person they have attended my shows but if you bring them there obviously focusing on the word but I think the communal spaces should become more inclusive. So people, especially mainstream videos and audios should be made more accessible to the hearing impaired and the visual impaired. Then they can go back and participate on the same of uh, the same uh, confidence as the rest of the population is. Otherwise, if they're having to see a separate screening for the visual, for the hearing impaired. So you're segregating them. So to, I mean, there is some segregation that has happened by nature, but if you can involve them, like how you, you would see as a family, I think yeah. that will empower them. They, they'll feel more confident and valued that they're as good as the others are, and therefore they can participate in what others are doing. So I strongly believe we should make things more inclusive. Yes. Theater as well. I, yes, I think this has been a very landmark conversation in the aspect that we have been on uh, discussion because there are uh, loads of takeaways and uh, I think this attitudinal change has to come from our end where we say that not see what they can't do. We mm. focus on what and all they can do. Yeah. That is one thing. Yes, second thing is very relevant what you said about is transferable skills is what we call here in India is application of the learned skills in varied areas of your life. And uh, yes, uh, the example that Indira Madam gave, you know, where uh, she probably was so successful and had a beautiful experience because she did not define the do's and the don'ts. Mm -hmm. She gave an entire open platform who wanted to draw, who wanted to dance, who wanted to sing and express themselves. The basic thought process to come out of the mind in different forms is what was beautiful and learning happened. So that do's and don'ts that we sometimes restrict our students is something which we should learn to. As I said earlier, we are all in work in progress. So we need to learn and learn and relearn ourselves so that we are able to give the real uh, what what actually the students can do and give them that, you know, move the curtain off the eyes and they'll be able to see the light of the day. So, I mean, this was a beautiful interaction all together and we'll move on to the next question because we would otherwise be running short of time. And the next question, again, I would put it to Ilima ma'am, where we are talking about the socioeconomic factors that obviously play a very important role in access not only in access and also attainment of education. So how do you think this gap can be reduced and every child gains quality education through digitization? So again, so this is a this is something, this was exactly the reason why I started producing audiobooks because again, going back to my uh, previous, uh, uh, not an argument, what I understood is that language is such an important tool going forward, whether it is to, to face another person. And once you become confident in your language, I think you're likely to see the other person in the eye and possibly communicate a lot more effectively because you know you're able to speak very well. It's not an impediment anymore. So to be to facilitate that, I have put my audiobooks on YouTube for free, but I do not know how to make them reach 
uh, a wider uh, society, the wider society or, or children from different schools or different uh, parts of India or the world. So to answer this big question, I feel there's a lot of digital uh, material available of very good quality that can reach uh, children, especially when they're growing up, they need to be, they need to be, they need to have access to good quality material, whether it is visual or audio and challenges as well. So I think there should be a central body in each district that has a log of all schools. And therefore, if we, like, if I, I'm only talking about the problems that I'm facing, I would love my audiobooks to reach out to all these schools. Because again, as I say, I mean, uh, reading stories is a privilege. So if a child is being read by their parents, it's a privilege. And I, I know it doesn't happen in every household, but it is such an important part in a child's um, youth, young age because it connects all those nerve, nerve endings and they, you know, they have new parts formed because they've understood a concept more easily because they've heard it either repetitively or over a period of time. So to be able to do that, if I want to send it to schools, let us say in, 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 in a remote part of Hyderabad, which I don't have physical access to, or maybe I'm not even aware of that. I don't know how to do it. I, I keep looking at on the internet, call them to see if I could send a link of my work to them so they could possibly share it with their school children. Therefore, I think to answer, to facilitate people who are working in this area, I think if each district or each zone, however one would like to demarcate it, if they can have a log of all schools, thank God we have digitally, I think it's, uh, there's good reach everywhere. So if we have access, then that's, we could send it to that central body and they could then send it to different schools. So I think that's something very much doable, but we need, we need a central database and we need a point of contact because even if I have the database, I, I'll, I'll keep sending it, but it can be sitting in their spam, right? So I need I need a, a person, an educator, who's, who's responsible for that district or for that region. So my port of contact will be that person and I will send my information to that person and that person can then send it to the heads of the schools that they are able to uh, sort of oversee. So in that way, I think we could democratize uh, content as well. If, for people who are providing it for free. And then we could take it from there and make it more uh, holistic and more comprehensive. Maybe we can add more material to make that experience more comprehensive. But till um, we have that person, I know I'm facing that issue. I so want everybody to listen in whichever language that I've produced the audiobooks or the puppet shows and gain something because we're all beneficiaries of what we have heard and what we have watched around us. And I think we have to provide that to everybody for free if possible, so that they are uh, benefiting and they, that, that spark is ignited in them and therefore they can see something uh, to do going forward. If I'm not wrong, what we are looking at is basically an outreach program where uh, centralization to decentralization. Yes. Yes. And, uh, what I gather from the discussion that we have had till now, I think this could be something like a project for the students, of the students, and by the students. Yes. Content and also, we need a they, they, we need somebody somebody who who can who can yeah who can uh, continue the chain of information. And, and and more importantly, that it is implemented in realistic yes uh, into the you know classroom setup wherever or, uh, you know, the setup that is uh, possible uh, so that there is an understanding, there is that advantage that one can gain over of the content that is being relevant. So I think, yeah, of the students, for the students and by the students. It's a wonderful thing which can be done. And I think uh, that uh, ownness or having that sense of belonging would bring another level of uh, confidence in the students, you know, once they are uh, exposed to such kind of platforms. Yes, like it's now it's summer holidays, isn't it? So I feel this children, this is May is one month when children, it's so hot in most parts of India, they can't get out of their houses. So I feel instead of them not knowing what to do, it's wonderful to be able to say, okay, here is a story, listen to it to the best of your ability. You list, they listen to it. They may not understand all the words, but 
somewhere that spark is ignited and they will work on it. They may look it up online to see what does this word mean. So they build their vocabulary, phraseologies. I'm sure through this webinar and the outreach that we have, I'm sure it is going to make a lot of difference to many people around the world. I'm sure there are lots of parents who are listening. These ideas, I mean, today we are all, you know, uh, we are all making things. So we could probably have an uh, outburst of storytellers mm -hmm. and, you know, creating content in that manner. And they definitely develop their language. They develop their creative skills. They develop their communication skills. I think this is one way where, you know, a lot of skills that we listed down some time ago can be really achieved in a, and this is uh, like somebody, I think earlier said that uh, we are not, um, this thing for entertainment we are using it for art is used not for entertainment but for education but little I would like to tweak that is like we are in, in a very entertaining manner we are educating yeah. our students so that is a you know it keeps, keeps the students very engaged and uh, which is again at the end of the day I think every person wants a happy child a happy student that is the basic thing or what do you call the basic fundamental goal that we all want or have or keep in mind when we are in uh, set a setup with a child at any place whether it is a school or it's a home or it's a playground so yes with that uh, we'll go on to the next question in our discussion which is which i would put it to lena madam and uh, the question there is that change and volatility is the new constant and uh, there are changes upheavals globally be it demographically or even economic or pertaining to our environment. Now, resilience is the key to our survival because these sometimes change becomes so fearful that people are unable to face the change. And what we need is resilience that is definitely there. So kindly throw some light on the role of education and education technology to develop a resilient society where the younger generation opts for sustaining than quitting. So over to you, Lena Maj. Thanks. Yeah, it's a topic close to my heart because um, during 2020 pandemic, uh, many of my students who uh, were, you know, uh, going to be graduates, uh, they had a standstill, uh, you know, they came to a standstill, say third year, final year engineering, or uh, everything came to a halt. So I told them this is pandemic. There was epidemic back then when um, Isaac Newton uh, was uh, sent back home to his hometown in England. And he was sitting under the apple tree and the apple fell down and the rest is history, how gravity was discovered. So I was telling my students, uh, look at it like this. It's an opportunity to learn, to discover, to explore possibilities. Uh, you know, maybe you could have some discovery, innovation, patent to your name. If you, uh, you know, make the most of this time. Look, everyone went through that phase. It was not just uh, a bad phase for youngsters or for one person or for uh, this age group or that age group. We all went through it. So I was telling the students, don't get disheartened. Uh, learn a lot from this process. This is also a learning uh, you know, lesson. So uh, just change your pace, change your gears, and then learn something. Read. You, we are just reading, reading. But OK, uh, tap the right brain uh, you know, centers so that you develop creativity, do painting, you do something that you like. So, uh, you know, creativity, imagination, uh, because they are more, far more important and uh, relevant than just the knowledge. That's what Einstein also says. Creativity and imagination, they are far more important than just knowledge, education. When we have all these factors, then we put our education into use or application, and then that by that we are doing value addition so when it came to my students and for that matter all age groups but i was telling them don't get disheartened treat this as an opportunity to discover something uh, to know your own self explore your inner self and then go and conquer the world and the universe outside so there were many ways in which i was uh, you know inspiring motivating them because maybe in that way uh, because they were all at distant places and uh, they were going through uh, webinars and e-learning, uh, that process. So they were close to parents, but like uh, it was pointed out earlier, maybe 
some students or the youngsters kids they are not so close with the parents they are not doing eye contact communication with them so with whom will they talk when they are the peers they have their friends and then they have the teachers or a person like me i'm not just an educator i'm a mentor to many so in this way i was uh, telling them a lot about such things uh, you know like motivating them even every day for that matter so uh, okay uh, then uh, i was also telling them it could be war or it could be pandemic epidemic but we need to be empowered to uh, go through teaching learning process and which is flexible and like your question is very valid change we all resist change it's a human tendency to resist it for we have our inhibitions and we uh, do not easily accept things but it is uh, the acceptance that will make us uh, that will enable us and will conquer all those fears and all that so change is very uh, inevitable and it was it's a very dynamic world now the scenario so we need to adapt to that and then that is how the youngsters from primary to secondary and to all age level uh, at all levels and even the professionals they were sharing their content their education teaching learning and apart from that Uh, their projects and all professionals were do, doing that. So uh, the uh, digital learning, this and especially ICT, I give a lot of importance to the information technology, communication, and all this. The integration of all these convergence of these technologies, and today we have many apps easily available for students. If this happens, do this and things like that. So education. through digital medium which was first not treated officially you know valid today we are you know banking on it and then like i said earlier there are today online classes there is hybrid mode uh, even the practical sessions my science students they did that learning through uh, demo and experiments which is very tough and then when they can do that then they can do anything in the world so all this and the change that happened Uh, in 2020 it is still with us even if things are relaxed now traveling is uh, very easily possible and we are back to near normal again but this is uh, you know uh, the uh, irreversible thing that we learned so uh, thanks to technology and in india uh, looking at the diverse uh, you know diversity and the population and uh, like i always say the urban uh, areas like mumbai pune and bangalore the mega cities we have all the resources and we have resource persons like us but it is the grassroots level the smaller towns to uh, second tier uh, towns and smaller uh, cities or towns and villages and we need to go to the grassroots level to understand if they are also learning the things that we are teaching at schools so it is important to ensure that and um, that is very important so uh, during emergency and it could be war it could be pandemic it could be anything but uh, that is a very uncertain and uh, you know uh, very uh, odd phase in life for the kids they are very tiny but still we all need to accept and it's not just the right to education but also schools and education system they provide uh, they are like anchors you know uh, when students are looking forward to this talk Uh, yes, if Shweta Ma'am is teaching the students and conducting uh, a say online class, so so the kids are looking forward and uh, they get ready and they sit there glued to their uh, laptop or computers or whatever, and they are learning. So we need to create this kind of enthusiasm. So it's a very uh, you know dull phase or uh, it was depressing for some people, but it is very important. to incorporate this change and we all need to be very flexible and versatile to adapt to this change life could bring or the scenario could be anything like i said war or natural calamities floods or a pandemic or any kind of even crisis like uh, emergency or uh, national uh, crisis or any kind of uh, situation where in their normal life or school this comes to an and or to stand still but we need to easily adapt to this kind of system 
And then uh, maybe it was not seamless initially, but we really did that. And uh, I really salute the teachers and uh, the schools because that is very important. The kids, their schools and all this did not suffer the teaching learning process. The show must go on, we say like that. It was going on and uh, really uh, that is very appreciable. And India as a nation, uh, we, are really, uh, we are really proud and I uh, applaud the governance and everything, even the uh, vaccination drive, the education, all that. I think we quickly adapted to that as compared to, and in terms of uh, uh, the population, and despite the diversity, we still could do a lot of it, and we did good work. And there were, there have been warriors, COVID warriors like that, not just medical field and, uh, you know, uh, the healthcare and all, but teachers and the schools. And we really need to salute and, uh, you know, applaud the schools and teachers, really. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful response and your, uh, you know, the, the the basic gist that I get is that we need to ensure an outreach and we need to, uh, you know, have that virtue of adaptability. So these two things will definitely contribute towards developing resilience. We honestly have, uh, I think, another 180 seconds to go. Okay. So within that time, if uh, Indira Madam and Nilima Madam put throw some light on the very same aspect of developing resilience. If we have that, we could uh, do it. And uh, I would require request Nilima, Mad Nilima Madam to go first with it. If there's something that you would like to share on this ground. Yeah, so as I said to me, I'll, I know I'll, I'll sound like a broken record, but to me, the, the two most important things I feel are that to develop resilience is to have a set of transferable skills and you're not daunted by change because you have the core skills which are so strong and communication in this day and age is so important so we need to make sure that the next generation or students wherever have a have good command over any language that they want to take up. If it could be a native language or it could be Hindi or English. As soon as you become proficient in one language, strangely enough, you become proficient in other languages as well. So I would continue to emphasize on language as a communication tool and building up a core set of transferable skills that uh, will hold them in good stead. That was a very crisp and a short uh, one, and you really did it in 60 seconds. So I would move on to Indira, Madam, for the, you know, kind of a finishing line with this, uh, for this very same aspect on developing resilience. So as uh, Neelama, Ma'am, and uh, Lina Ma'am, everybody emphasized on uh, language. I am reminded of a very interesting line that one of my uh, uh, French friends told me. In India, if you just make one person from every language or every, every state stand in one line and speak together, it becomes a beautiful chaos. <laughs> so what what that meant was, it sounded, it, um, India is, is so diverse, it is such a diverse country that we have diversity in every uh, 10 to 15 kilometers, <laughs> whether it be in terms of language, culture, anything. So this is one platform, I would say, wherein we can instill, we can help our students, uh, generation of tomorrow, instill resilience. Throwing focus, specific focus on uh, being multilinguistic and uh, having transferable skills. So this is one very big platform wherein we can actually use this uh, uh, diversity and this multilingualism, multicultural, this melting pot, I would say, the beautiful melting pot that we have in our country. It's a very beautiful platform to actually instill resilience. So with that, I just end my words. Yes, and uh, I think we have uh, touched upon uh, all the aspects on, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, education and things like that there is one small thing of course which wasn't a part of the conversation at, in any remote way and uh, to develop transferable skills or develop resilience or develop communication or collaboration or that uh, there are two things which i would like to add on to everything that we have said which is again a very important part for education is that we need to have this um, being one with our own selves and you know uh, focusing a little bit on our physical health and you know mental health which is probably yoga with great emphasis needs to be given uh, yes. to that aspect in life for sure because without that life gets totally scattered so this is being one with oneself and that really helps a lot with that and um, in change uh, accepting change and accommodating it and as she very beautifully said a beautiful chaos so we love the chaos and uh, with that i think we come to the end of this beautiful session that we have had and there has been a lot of you know takeaways in this session and uh, before we end i would like to uh, you know present the vote of thanks i would like to thank uh, <clears throat> mrs lena mrs linima and mrs indira for having spared their valuable time for us and give us valuable and rec inputs and recommendations uh, i also would like to thank the audience who have been with us through this session for their time and patient listening and uh, uh, i thank the back team uh, for you know taking uh, all the trouble to make this session so seamless and uh, you know the support that they have offered through and through without being uh, present out here and uh, being at the backdrops and uh, last but last but not the least i would like to thank vidyadan for giving me this opportunity to being on this platform having this you know very fine opportunity of interacting with such wonderful people on uh, this panel so with this i think uh, a big thank you to all of you for your time and it's been really wonderful having a chat with you and uh, looking forward to keep connected thank you so much namaste thank you